Good morning, everyone. Today is the 16th of June, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Gene Lawler and I are delighted to host these webinars featuring outstanding speakers on subjects related to mediation, arbitration, negotiation, lawyering, and just the way human beings communicate with each other. As you know, there's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you're able to do so in honor of our great speakers. And every week, one of my favorite parts of the program is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed since we began this series. So Gene Lawler, let me turn it over to you, please take it away. Thanks so much, Jeff, and hello, and uh, good morning, good day, good evening to everyone. Uh, the number today is uh, of uh, donations to food banks around the world that we know about, $287,063.11. So we're getting amazingly close to $300,000. Everybody's generosity is just amazing, and thank you all so much. Everyone benefits. Jeff, back to you. Gene, thank you so much. That is incredible. And today we are delighted to have Henry Yampolsky as our guest speaker. Henry just published this terrific book, Dissolving Conflict from Within. And let me read you a little bit about Henry before we turn it over to him. Henry is a mediator, educator, TEDx speaker, yogi, and lawyer who serves as the assistant director for education, outreach, and conflict resolution at Virginia Tech's Office for Equity and Accessibility. He also teaches mediation, conflict resolution, and peace building as part of Virginia Tech Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention. Henry's a member of the board of directors of the Virginia Mediation Network and the member of Mediators Beyond Borders International. Henry has worked with hundreds of complex conflicts and has taught and lectured around the world, including at Virginia Tech, Columbia Law School, National Museum of American Jewish History, Bellevue uh, Mediation in Zurich, Switzerland, Gandhi Smitri and Darshan Samidi International Gandhi Center and Museum in New Delhi, and at the uh, Bharatiar University in Coimbatore, India. Henry is also a master level instructor of Sattva Yoga, having studied yoga in Rishikesh, India. Uh, Henry's TEDx talk about what crossing the Himalayas on a motorcycle taught him about conflict, connection, and dialogue is available on TED, uh, TED.com. You can find Henry on his motorcycle in the mountains of Southwest Virginia and also at www.livingpeaceinstitute.com. I'm about halfway through the book and I'm finding it absolutely fascinating. Henry, we're so happy to have you. Please tell us a little bit about the food bank to which you'd like contributions be directed if people are in a position to contribute. And then on with your presentation about dissolving conflict from within. Our friend Henry Ampolsky, please unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's such a privilege for me to be part of this program. So first, uh, on to the charity that we hope to support today. You know, we, um, right uh, before we started uh, this webinar, we had a discussion and uh, as I will share a little bit about, I am from Ukraine and my initial intention was to support a charity here in Southwest Virginia, where I live, a, fo a food bank in Southwest Virginia, where I live. But considering the continuing situation in Ukraine, uh, I would uh, request, uh, if it is possible for, for you to support uh, this organization called Razum for Ukraine. Uh, Jeff, would it be appropriate for me to put uh, the link in the chat? Um, so let me let me yes, do please. this. Please do, Henry. Um, so I just put the link in the chat, and this is the organization that is supporting uh, the relief uh, effort in Ukraine. Uh, with particular focus on refugees. Um, right now, still the biggest need um, is assisting those who have been both internally displaced and then uh, individuals who uh, unfortunately had to cross the border uh, to Poland 
uh, to other places in Europe. So uh, if this resonates with you, um, uh, that's th that's the organization that I hope that we can um, we can support. And with that, with that said, Jeff, sh sh shall I, uh, Jeff, and yeah. and Jean, uh, shall I just uh, talk a little bit about kind of um, the journey? Uh, yeah. I, I would like to talk a little bit about my journey, um, and then some of the lessons um, that I learned from this journey. And hopefully, in the lessons, um, I will also talk about how I think all of us, as as peace builders, as lawyers, as people who just care about social justice, what is happening in the world, can maybe apply these lessons to the work that we are doing. And I would invite, I hope that this is as much of a conversation as is possible. So if, as I am speaking and sharing, if anything is arising for you, please feel free to jump in. Please feel free to either unmute yourself or post your comments in the chat. Um, I would love to engage uh, and, and hear from you as well. So I mentioned Ukraine, and this is where, in many ways, my journey began. Um, I am originally from Ukraine. I came to this country 25 years ago, and my family and I came here to escape religious persecution in Ukraine. We're Jewish, uh, and we came with the last wave of Soviet Jews uh, in 1994. And we came to Scranton, Pennsylvania. And Scranton, Pennsylvania has kind of been in the news as this kind of all, all American town, you could say, town with maybe the, the, that a, city, a small city that is past its prime. And so when we came in 1994, uh, being immigrants, not speaking English, we were downright exotic in Scranton. We were downright exotic. And my parents and I, I was 14, uh, had a very difficult time. Uh, we've had a very, very difficult time adjusting to this new place, to this new world, very new to us world, very new to us environment. And this is where I first developed a desire, a dream to become a lawyer, because I thought if I would become a lawyer, I would be able to be the voice for folks like my parents, for folks who did not have much of a voice, for immigrants, for underprivileged. And so I was very set on becoming a lawyer and I had a dream of being a litigator. And, you know, I watched all these TV shows uh, about trials and going to court. And uh, by my sophomore year in college, I was convinced that this is what I wanted to do. And so I went through college, I went through law school and I became a litigator and I was doing a lot of work in civil rights. I was doing a lot of work in labor and employment. I was representing people um, who were underprivileged, poor. Um, I was representing immigrants and refugees. So I was living in many ways um, what I thought was my dream. But very quickly um, in the practice of litigation and, and, and about seven or eight years into my legal career, I started to feel burned out. And I began to feel very frustrated. And I began to realize that actually my clients who were mostly poor, who were mostly non-white, who very often did not speak English, could not express themselves, could not really express their needs, really were not being empowered through the court system. Uh, you know, the, it, it, when they filed a matter in court, um, they would be very often English was was was. was a second language to them. And, and, and then they would be exposed and be required to, in some ways, learn this whole other language that was even more foreign to them. So instead of whatever name they had, they became known as plaintiff or defendant. And people spoke, even, even when they were, most of the time they were not even present and not part, uh, of the, this very complicated process that they were going through. At times when they were part of it, people were speaking about them using these terms and using this language that was completely foreign to them. And it was very frustrating for me 
going through the litigation process, going through discovery, going through all of that, as I started noticing that this process was bringing out the worst in me, bringing out very often the worst in my clients, and bringing out often the very worst in, in my opponents, who um, very often I had immense respect for, had very good relationships with. But then when we got engaged you know, in these cases, um, very often things became very, very difficult and petty and, and difficult to resolve. And I was just struck by how expensive, long, um, and how difficult these processes were especially for my clients who very often were poor, who very often were underprivileged, who very often, you know, even taking a day from work to attend mediation or attend court session or attend some kind of meeting um, was an immense burden for them, immense burden for them. And to me, I started thinking about, I, I started wondering, is there another way? Is there another way for us as human beings to approach our conflict interactions. And this coincided with a period in my life uh, where I was just searching for something different. You know, I, I was living this dream. I wanted to be a lawyer. Here I was, I was a lawyer. I was working with a wonderful firm. I was on my way to becoming a partner at this firm at a very young age. So I had everything my mom could ever want for an immigrant son. But it was becoming clearer to me that that's not what I wanted. And then motorcycles came into my life. Now, this may sound like something very self-indulgent, and it was. Uh, but yet for me, motorcycles were the vehicle, this vehicle for transformation, personal transformation and professional transformation that took place. I was looking for passion, and I was talking to a friend who was also a lawyer. And this friend shared with me, you know, this passion that they had for motorcycles. And I decided to start riding it, riding motorcycles. And my wife thought that I just went crazy and, and that I was having an early onset midlife crisis. And, you know, this created a lot of tension, but I knew, I knew that I had to do it and that motorcycles would take me on a different path in life. I didn't know what that path would be, but I knew that this hobby uh, would be very, very transformative. And as it turned out, it was, because it was through motorcycles that I met uh, a teacher, a young man from India who was teaching yoga. Now, when I talk about yoga, I don't mean just stretching, uh, you know, bending and stretching. When I talk about yoga, uh, and the word yoga in Sanskrit means unity. So this man, while he was teaching some yogic techniques, really what he was teaching is the ancient art and science of connection. Connection both within and connection without. And so I met uh, this person in Virginia, spent five days with him uh, at a retreat. And after that, my wife and I both looked at each other and we said, we're going to India. And, and we had no idea how or why or what would happen next? And I faced the very, very tough task of going to the managing partner of my firm. And I was a senior associate at the time on my way of becoming a partner, um, had a very busy trial deposition schedule. And I know we have probably some, some folks who are lawyers on this call. You know, taking a month off um, when you work at a firm is just not something that you do. So I was fully prepared that if I, as I go to request this time off from our managing partner, that they would invite me to just, you know, take the rest of your life off and um, leave. But I was, I was ready, I, I was ready and willing to do that because spending that month in India was very, very important. And to my surprise, my firm, uh, to their great credit, uh, were very supportive. And they said, look, you know, there are more important things than, you know, discovery motions and even motions for summary judgment. We are here for you. We will cover for you. Go do what you need to do. And so I went to India and 
this was probably the most transformative experience that I had in my life because I was exposed to some very, very profound teachings, teachings that are ancient, teachings that predate uh, many of the major religions and teachings that really open my eyes on how we view conflict and how we view our connections and what can we do to empower people to communicate better. So to kind of fast forward a little bit, India became my second home. And as of today, I have been in to India 15 times. And it was in India that it became very, very clear to me that I just could not go back to being a litigator. It just no longer appealed to me. Ironically, I came back and my firm was even more supportive than I could ever anticipate. After taking a month off, coming back, I was offered a partnership at the firm. So I was 33, a partner at, the, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a firm, working with wonderful people, doing meaningful work, having again everything that my mom could ever even dream about for an immigrant son. And when this partnership was offered to me, and before I, I thought this is all I wanted. This is all I wanted. I wanted this partnership. I wanted to be a partner in this law firm. It became very, very clear to me that, that in fact, that's not what I wanted at all. And that I wanted to pursue work in creating space where people could engage and connect with each other in a way that goes beyond sometimes the very limited and very formalistic and very um, scripted way that the legal process necessitates the engagements. And so this is where I got very involved with the collaborative law community and integrative law community, learning from folks like Stu Webb and Kim Wright, um, getting mediation training and, 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 and learning from different mediators, being exposed to the work of Ken Cloak, uh, that, of course, that, I, that, that I presume many of you know, um, Gary Friedman uh, and others, and others who were approaching uh, the field of conflict and conflict resolution in very creative, in very, very unusual ways. And then another thing happened as I was exploring all of these, for me, I was, I was continuing to travel to India. I was continuing to immerse myself into the very profound teachings of yoga. And I was wondering if there, there was a way to kind of bridge the gap, in, so to speak. You know, I was, I was learning all, all these things about mediation and conflict resolution and peace building. And then I was learning all of these things about yoga and, and inner journey was their way to piece the two. And there was a way, and the way came again through motorcycles. So I was just writing for a motorcycle blog, motorc online motorcycle magazine, just as a hobby. And my assignment was to interview this person from Denmark, who was a very well-known copyright lawyer in Europe, and then left her job, moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then traveled solo on a motorcycle to New York and wrote a book about it called The Road to Getting Myself Out of the Way. And the point of the book can be summed up in one sentence. Wherever she went, there she was. We can't run away from, it, from ourselves, even if we change everything outside of us unless we start looking within. So Annette and I connected. We started working together. It became very apparent that something was coming through us. And through us came this process called dissolving conflict from within, um, which is in many ways uh, an important aspect uh, of the book uh, that Jeff was talking about. But broader than that, as I continued to work um, as, now as a mediator and, and conflict coach and facilitator um, and, and moved away from practice of law in a traditional sense, I started seeing some patterns uh, in various interactions that I had with people and I started, and what began to emerge for me were the three, the, the, I'm sorry, the four principles 
of conflict transformation. I started seeing certain aspects of conflict that kind of kept repeating and kept coming up in different situations, whether we talked about legal conflicts, whether we talked about interpersonal conflicts, or whether we talked even about conflicts be between nations and, and, and people and societies. And so these four principles, um, as I see them, are tuning inward, tuning inward. So in the West, when we talk about mindfulness, when we talk about yoga, when we talk about meditation, traditionally, we talk about these disciplines as a way to feel better. This is a way to deal with stress. This is a way to reduce your blood pressure. This is a way to focus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I started seeing tuning inward as a way to get better at feeling. Not, not as a way to feel better, but as a way to get better at feeling. So I thought there was a need for mediators, for peace builders, for lawyers, for everyone who is, is in, in this world where we are working with people, where we are trying to empower people to move through various challenges that they may have, whether it's a legal challenge, whether it's a life change challenge, something else, that it was very, very important for us as practitioners to have a personal practice so that we become more sensitive to where people are. And, you know, again, when we talk about sensitivity in the West, there is a bad connotation. Generally, when we talk about sensitivity, we mean that someone is too reactive. That's not what I mean. I mean sensitivity to knowing where people are so that we can meet them where they are. And to me, this was a very, very profound and very, very important tool and skill of being a peace builder, being a mediator, being, you know, again, whatever is the particular title that we have, that doesn't matter, but having that inner practice. And also, I thought that part of our job as, as mediators, lawyers, conflict resolution professor, professionals, again, whatever may be the specific role, is also to create that space for people we work with to tune, to tune inward. Because what I discovered very often is when people came to me Actually, they did not know what was important for them. And you know, when, when I would probe and ask, so, so, so tell me, what, what, what would you need? What is most important for you? I found very often that people would give me their position and then kind of repeat that position with either louder or with more attitude. That's what a lot of lawyers did. That's what I did as a lawyer, right? You kind of state a position and then you restate it with a little more attitude, maybe with a little more, you know, a few more cases thrown in, a few more citations. But I felt that through that, we weren't actually getting to the real issue at hand, the real issue that, what, that, that these people faced. And so that's where I thought it was very important for us as practitioners to have that inner practice, to do that inner work, so that we create space for our clients in our presence to do the same and have the courage to probe and invite the clients on that journey to do the same, to really discover what is, what is important for them, why are they doing this, and to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. The next aspect, um, the second principle of conflict transformation that, 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 that came up for me is observation without evaluation. Now, this is uh, those of you who are students of nonviolent communication and the work of Marshall Rosenberg. This is this will sound very, very familiar. So this is becoming aware in our language, in our day to day interactions, right? How often we use judgments, labels, evaluations and conclusions. And this is so this is so natural for us and to moving as much as possible to observation without evaluation. But there is a second dimension to that. And the second dimension is creating a culture of active listening. So one of the very sad aspects of practicing law for me was that I found actually, I thought that I was a terrible, now looking back, when I spent years really developing my listening skills, I realized what a terrible listener I was as a lawyer. 
And actually, you know, from all the courses I took in law school, so I took civil procedure and criminal procedure and evidence and um, constitutional law, all of these things. I did not have a single class, a single lecture, a single experience where someone taught me how to listen. How do you actually sit and listen to someone who is going through very challenging experience to someone who's, you know, um, really is looking to you for help, um, but needs empowerment, needs support, needs all of that. And I never learned any of that in law school. I never learned how to deal with emotions in law school. And again, because my work, my legal work involved people, actual people, you know, I didn't work um, too much with things like mergers and acquisitions and, you know, areas where maybe you don't deal as my, my, many of my clients were not very sophisticated, almost always completely new to the legal process. This is something that I thought was really missing. So observation without evaluation developing that culture, that practice of active listening. And actually in the book, I, I, I try to break down active listening in, into just, just its sort of core components so that it becomes a skill and a tool that we as professionals, again, whatever may be our role, whether it's a lawyer, coach, mediator, judge, whatever, whatever that may be, that we take that and are able to apply this to our work, to our life. Now, something else that came up for me, you know, now, I, now that I do this work, a lot of people will talk to me and ask me, well, Henry, we find it strange and we find it interesting that you don't talk about empathy. And notice I, I did not use the word empathy now um, in, in dealing with our clients because I don't think empathy is the value actually that we wanna emphasize in our work. And this is connected to observation without evaluation. You see, if I say to you, to any of you, I'd like to be in your shoes. I'd like, you know, I I'd like to experience what you're experiencing. The reality is that I really can't. The reality is that I can never truly be in another person's shoes. And so that's where I respectfully disagree with the current emphasis on empathy, but instead believe that in our roles, in our professions, we need to emphasize compassion. How do I define compassion? I define compassion as knowing full well, knowing full well that we can never be in another person's shoes but also being deeply, deeply connected to their humanity. How do we connect to someone else's humanity? First, we have to be deeply connected to our own humanity. And this is again, where we come back to that personal practice. This is again, where we come back to that invitation to get better at feeling rather than just feeling better. Because if we are connected to our own pain, then we can connect to the pain of other people. Even though we know that we can never truly know exactly what they're going through. So when we're talking about listening and active listening in our professions, in our roles, I see it as compassion and action. I see it as compassion and action. In fact, in my work as a lawyer, as a mediator, as a coach, now as an educator, um, working in higher education, I think one of the greatest gifts we can give to another person is listening to them. We don't have to, we don't, we may not always have the tools to fix whatever the situation is. We may not always have the tools to problem solve. We may not always have the tools to address whatever is happening. But the least we can do for another human being is provide that deep, deep listening to them. So third dimension uh, of conflict transformation that emerged for me is expansion, expansion. So in my observation, you know, when we are dealing with conflict, when people are in conflict, again, whether it's a legal conflict, whether it's an interpersonal conflict, whether it's a conflict among nations, 
focus becomes very narrow. Focus becomes very, very narrow. We start focusing on past grievances or we focus on future anxieties. And paraphrasing Nelson Mandela, he, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something along the lines of when in conflict, one of the first sort of one of the first one of the first things we lose in conflict is we lose sight of all the possibilities, all the possibilities, the big picture that may exist. And so for me, expansion, I think, is a very, very important tool and skill uh, and goal of what we're trying to do. Again, doesn't matter what our role is and whether we're serving as a mediator, arbitrator, coach, whatever it is. And I think when we're talking about expansion, what I mean by that is something very, very particular. I mean by that expansion from positions. So most of our arguments are positional arguments. Most lawsuits are very positional binary uh, presentations, right? There is a plaintiff, there is a defendant, plaintiff has a position, defendant has a position. They're kind of battling it out to see who will end up on top. Um, sometimes mediation provides um, sort of an, an, an exit ramp for it, but still the result is very, very binary. And, and very often the result is still very much based on positions. It's still very, very positional result. And most of you I think would be aware and are familiar with uh, the teachings coming out of the Harvard Negotiation Project uh, on interest-based negotiations and, and, and the importance of interest. And while I think this, this, this research and, 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 and these teachings are profound and powerful, considering where we are as people and as a society, I will suggest that that's not enough. It is not enough for us to move from positions to interest. I believe there are more layers that we need to uncover. And these layers include, so we move from positions to interests, to and through emotions. We absolutely have to deal with emotions in conflict. If we don't deal with emotions in conflict, we are doing disservice to ourselves and we're doing disservice to our clients. And sadly, you know, I've encountered many mediators and many practitioners who, you know, when someone becomes emotional, they become very uncomfortable. And they would immediately sort of try to, okay, let's take a break. Here, grab a cup of water. Please don't cry. They, that's not the way to deal with that. We need to create space where we actually hear and engage the emotions. So emotions, then we need to go to the layer of values. And finally, and most importantly, finally, and most importantly, we need to get to the layer of needs. And I will suggest to you that our positions may be all over the place. Even our interests, especially now, could be all over the place. There's gonna be some similarity in our emotions. There's gonna be more similarity in our values. When we start talking about our needs, our fundamental needs are gonna be the same. And as I mentioned in the book, I, I consider that, most, in my experience, most conflicts revolve around seven fundamental needs. And these are needs for security, autonomy, authenticity, connection, beauty, meaning, and expansion. Now, there's many layers to each of these needs that I, we don't have time to go into now. And there may be very, very different strategies to meet these needs. But the moment we can shift the conversation from positions to and through interests, to and through values, to and th I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I forgot emotions. Okay, in, in, interest, emotions, values, and then needs, we're fundamentally changing conflict interaction. Final aspect that I want to that I want to mention now is exploration. The final principle that I wanna mention is exploration. And this is my, as, as my good friend, Adina Tovell, um, she coined this term. This is about courage to be curious in conflict. 
you know, one of the first victims of conflict very often is curiosity. Because we create in our mind a caricature of whatever is the other side, we other them, and then we think that we know. Encourage to be curious in conflict or, or, or exploration in conflict also means that we move away from binary models of conflict resolution, from binary models of conflict where there is an us and a them, whether you call us plaintiffs and them defendant, whether you call us something else and them something else, we have to engage with the complexity and nuance and actually learn to lean into conflict, to discover actually the limitless possibilities that the conflict calls, that the conflict calls, excuse me. And then actually invites us to expand how we view conflict, just, just generally. If we view conflict, and for the most of Western history, we viewed conflict as kind of this competition of two narratives, one superior and one inferior. And then we design these processes like the court systems and, and, and others that help the superior narrative, um, what we call the truth, to emerge. Except that I think that we as people are not nearly as binary as these types of narratives, which makes it very, very difficult then for us to address complex multidimensional conflict situations in a binary way. And this is where I think we need to have other processes, more restorative processes um, to really help us and to really empower us to move away from the binary us versus them paradigm. So I know uh, Jeff and, and Jean, I went a little bit over um, what the, the 30 minutes. So let me pause here. I also, I, I was concerned that, uh, I don't know if, a connection was breaking up a little bit. Uh, I hope it was not, but uh, tell me if maybe anyone did not hear um, any parts of what I said. Henry, thank you. That was terrific. A lot of food for thought there. I think the signal was coming through loud and clear, both the technical quality as well as the substantive content. So Henry, let me ask you a question. We may be involved in a mediation with people who, you know, they're just there to get their medical bills paid because they were in a car accident or get a, a, a debt settled or a claim adjusted by an insurance adjuster or something that seems very mundane on its face. And you're talking about levels of human connection, which might be unfamiliar or perhaps even uncomfortable or unexpected to the people with whom we're working in our mediations. What do you suggest we do to try to explore whether people are interested in these deeper levels while understanding and respecting that mm -hmm. they're here to get their medical bills paid or their their claim adjusted for the overflowing toilet in their home or something like that? Um, how, how do we balance that? Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, this is such a great, such a great question, and of course, uh, the 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 important consideration behind this question is meeting people where they are at, right? If someone is coming to get their plumbing bill paid or uh, insurance claim adjusted, you know, it's purely transactional matter, it we absolutely have to respect that, and then we we engage in you know, on mediation, we engage in whether mediation, arbitration, other means we try to resolve those claims. I think a lot of times, though, we assume, especially in the legal realm, that that's all that is at play, right? So I represented a lot of clients in civil rights matters, in employment matters, where we would come to mediation, and mediation would be essentially a very transactional process. So they would say to us, all right, you playing if you're demanding $100,000, Defendant, you're offering $10,000. So then the job of the mediator would be to get us somewhere in the middle where as one mediator with one judge mediator would tell me if everyone is a little bit unhappy, 
right? We had a good mediation. The problem and concern that I have is very often, Jeff, we don't even probe anything further. And I believe that this is our role and our job as mediators to ask those difficult questions. So let's say you get the plumbing bill paid or claim adjusted or whatever it is that you're seeking on the transactional level. How would you feel? Is there anything else that is important for, for you? Why is that important for you? And I think we have to be, again, it's reading the situation, reading the clients, reading kind of the circumstances. But I think taking a note from Ken Cloak's brilliant book, Mediating Dangerously, I think we have to be willing to ask those dangerous questions. What, 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 what more is there? Because I think very often, um, at least what I found and what I've seen, many mediators, conflict resolution professionals, peace builders, don't wanna engage with something beyond the transaction or transactional aspect because it's kind of scary. It's uncertain. It's ambiguous. It's unclear, right? So if we can come up with a number and we can put a check mark to say this case is resolved, it kind of makes it easier than to try to identify something that is non-monetary and maybe non-transactional. But I think there is the real possibility of transformation, um, a real possibility of dialogue, and a real possibility for us not just to problem solve, but to really empower. So I hope, Jeff, that answers your question. It does, Henry, it does. Let me ask you another uh, question, perhaps more philosophical question. And that is lately I've read certain critiques of the this approach of turning inward, trying to find a new sense of equanimity within yourself and dealing with the circumstances of the world mm -hmm. as being too passive mm -hmm. and not coming to grips with circumstances in the world, which may actually be quite bad a bad job, an oppressive boss, an abusive spouse, a bad circumstances, bad relationship. And how do you, let me ask you, how do you balance the sense of equanimity, internal equanimity, turning inward with the fact that we, I don't think we want to be coaching people or accepting situations in ourselves or others where we're be, being unduly acceptive Mm -hmm. accepting of circumstances which may objectively be oppressive or bad. Can you comment on that? Sure. Well, this is probably, I could, I could talk about it for, for semester, uh, you know, a semester long course. But fundamentally, Jeff, you know, what we're, we're, we're talking, when we're talking about inner and outer, you know, what's happening in the outer world, oh, this is bad, and what's happening in the inner world, in a way, we're talking about the illusion. This is an illusion, right? So Jeff, uh, you know, if, if if I took you and 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 you know, if you talk about sort of in in all, all the the inner peace and inward world and and all, all of those things, if we gave you anesthesia and cut you open, where would we find it? We wouldn't, right? We would we we wouldn't. We would just find sort of organs and blood and and and, and guts. So there are a couple of things here that I want to introduce to, to, the, to the listeners and suggest. So first of all, let's take violence in the world we're seeing right now on so many levels. It's so relevant and, and current and, it, and, and awful. I would like to suggest that the answer to violence and the opposite of violence is not peace. It is inclusion. Inclusion means we refuse to other anyone and anything. And inclusion means that we drop this division and this idea between inner and outer. So something that I would like to invite everyone to consider, and this is very hard, that the violence is happening in the world. And even you know the, the, these individuals that we're seeing that are committing um, this, this heinous, heinous, heinous acts of violence, you know, killing children, uh, killing grandmothers at a supermarket, 
invading countries and, and a long, long list of violence that is happening now. I wanna suggest that this violence is not separate from us. And this violence is not done by other people. This is all part of this collective consciousness that in the yoga tradition, we talk about that. And we're contributing to all of that. And if we're honest, if we're really, really honest with ourselves, I will suggest that there are parts of us that are extremely violent and that are capable of, of, of these heinous acts. So, so I, I, you know, when we talk about kind of political leaders we elect and, and the violence they perpetrate, the violence we see in our schools and all the levels of society. To me, Jeff, this is not about going within and saying, well, this is just happening out there. I'm just gonna sit here and meditate and you know I'm at peace and, and, and you know let them do whatever they do. This is creating that separation between us and them. And this is me and this is you and this is happening out there. No, this is not happening out there. If there is violence happening anywhere in the world, whether it's in US or whether it's in Zimbabwe, I am responsible for that violence. When I say responsible, I don't mean that I caused it. I mean that I am able to respond to it. And my response very often, so very often I, there is not much that I can do at the moment about the violence, but what I can do is to say what part of me, what part of me is contributing to that violence in the world? My teacher said something very, very profound on this very issue. He said, there are two types of violent people in the world. Most are people who have not been triggered enough. And then there is a small percentage, very small percentage, who are actually doing something about their violence. So if we are to do something about our violence, this distinction between inner and outer has to drop. If we start seeing all of it as, as, as connected, that what is happening within me is impacting what is happening in the world. What I put up maybe in, 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 in however small way, but if every one of us or even 10% of the human population took absolute radical responsibility for what we are contributing to the world, how we are impacting the world, how we are impacting the violence in the world, how we are impacting the level of dialogue in the world, the world would be a very, very different place. So Henry, let me challenge you mm -hmm. a bit on that. There's terrible violence in Ukraine right now. Do you somehow feel that your actions are responsible or contribute to Russian aggression against your relatives and, and kinsmen in Ukraine right now? Yes. So, and, and, and it's not that I caused, it's not, of course, that I caused the war or, or, or invaded Russia and Ukraine. But see, Jeff, when, um, what is contributing to, the, where, where does the violence, let's take the, the war in Ukraine. Where does it start? It starts any war, any violence begins with the idea. It begins with the idea that someone is the other. It begins with the identity. I am Russian, you're Ukrainian, yours because you were born on this patch of land and I'm on this patch of land, somehow we're different from each other. And so the moment that begins, you know, our identity is a boundary and a boundary can define us. Any boundary can define us. So I, this is how I would know, okay, this is Jeff's, this is mine. And a boundary can protect us, but there comes a point when a boundary is gonna start limiting us and confine us. And once there is a boundary, there is an idea that there is you and me and us and them. So how am I contributing to the conflict in Ukraine or to any other conflict that is happening in the world? I am contributing because so much and so often in my life, I perpetuate, perpetrate that idea of us and them. Because like you and like me, like everyone else, this is something that we're very, very much conditioned to do. Think about something, Jeff. I also want to challenge you. 
what if, what if your experience, your actual experience changed and shifted where you would experience me or anyone else on this call, wherever we are in the world, as part of you. So your idea of you expanded. So then, and, and what if it continued to expand, right? To include Ukraine and to include Zimbabwe and to include India and to include ev everything else, right? So then a couple things happen. First of all, do I, if you truly perceive me as part of you, do I need to tell you thou shall not kill or thou shall not commit all these acts of violence? Because then for you to commit an act of violence towards me would be the same as for my arm to stab my leg, right? They, they look differently, function differently, um, but they are part of the same whole. So if we start seeing, and this is a challenge, I know, because the world is very divided and it seems like we have all these divisions and differences. But if we start seeing the world and the fellow, fellow humans and, and people in different places and countries more and more as part of us, then I am responsible for what is happening in Ukraine just as much as I am responsible for what is happening in Zimbabwe. And again, when I say responsible, I don't mean that I, a cause and effect relationship. I don't mean that I or you or someone else caused the war in Ukraine. I mean that this is happening in our body, in our collective body, and then we are able to respond to it. We're able to respond to it. How are we able to respond to it? And what is the appropriate and what is the necessary response? Even at this time, even at this time, to refuse to see the other, to refuse to see, you know, here's, of course, to, to refuse to see people just in terms of these very limited identities, right? Based on the patch of geographic patch of land that are next to each other where they were born. So, you know, Henry, let me then ask how do you, how would you train people? To do that, I recall from sociology classes in college and reading about Durkheim and the mm -hmm. concepts of, I believe it was uh, bound identity, uh, you know, identity and boundaries, how natural it is mm -hmm. for human beings to, to create these kinds of uh, uh, boundary maintenance for purposes of identity formation. If that's really a natural or innate trait in human nature, what what do you suggest? Uh, it sounds like listening classes in law school are, are not going to be quite enough to, to overcome that. What should we do? Well, the four things that I, that I identified before, and that is tuning inward. And tuning inward, again, on multiple le levels and layers, right? So we're, we're, we, we all have a personal practice. The more inward we, be, we, we go, in my experience, Jeff, the more inclusive we become. And in fact, uh, if you look at the descriptions of enlightenment um, for many, uh, many of the many in the Eastern tradition, what they describe enlightenment as, as all of a sudden, you know, they would feel that they couldn't tell where they ended and someone else began. So it becomes an act of ultimate in in inclusion. So on a country, on a society level, on an interpersonal level, introducing these practices of tuning inward. So on a personal level, that is mindfulness, but again, mindfulness that is very, very intentional, very, very directed. On a culture, on a society, on an organizational level, this is where we start asking each other, you know, deep, profound questions. Not so, sometimes it, it's very easy for us to focus on exceptionalism, right? I work for the greatest organization. I live in the greatest country. And we don't sort of probe that. We don't go beyond that. What does it actually mean? What are some of the values we hold? Why? How, how do we uphold those values? So I think uh, beginning with that is very, very important. A culture of active listening. So this is more, of course, than an active listening course in law school. But, but when we start listening more and more to the people we don't, to the people we know, to the people we agree with, but especially, especially 
to the people we profoundly disagree with. Valerie Kaur, um, who is a, a, an activist, lawyer, civil rights uh, lawyer, wrote a brilliant book um, named See No Stranger. And there is a profound invitation that she extends in this book that I think really goes to the very core, Jeff, of what we, we're talking about. And that invitation is, and I'm gonna paraphrase her, but that invitation is, can you see others, and especially others that you not only disagree with, but maybe even despise, as parts of you, you do not yet know. It's such a deep invitation. It's a challenging invitation. But could we see other people, people we encounter as parts of us that we do not yet know? I think then focusing on expansion too, in all of our work, in all of our systems, because many of our systems are actually designed to kind of narrow things down, narrow things down instead of expand. When we talk about identities, by the way, one of the most powerful ways to deal with competing identities is to expand the identity, to create a new one. Nelson Mandela did this very, very successfully when he became first post-apartheid president of South Africa. In his 1994 address, you know, and, and it's so rare to hear a, any politician now speak in those terms. He is creating that new expanded identity, the identity of South Africans, black and white, those who can address common um, challenges they face, challenges of poverty and discrimination, all of that. So this is one powerful example where that could be done between two groups that were you know, enemies and, and oppressed each other for a long, long time. And then societally creating space for exploration, right? Where we engage with curiosity, where instead of running away from conflict, which is most, most of the time we either try to escape, avoid or control conflict. We learn and we learn skills in law school. We learn skills in grade school. We learn skills in elementary school to engage in conflict where it does not become destructive, but becomes an opportunity. And I think if we do that, Jeff, if we start learning those skills and learning to engage with each other in those ways, then naturally, naturally, people will start being more inclusive, expansive. And once we become more inclusive, it becomes very, very difficult for us to commit acts of violence towards each other because ultimate act of inclusion, love. What do we do in love? We include another being so much as part of us that their needs and their concerns and their whatever is important for them becomes even more important than our own needs, our own desires, et cetera. Henry, that's a, a wonderful note on which to end. Your answers have been so comprehensive and thorough and thought provoking. There's really a, a lot here. I know that some members of the audience might have questions they would like to pose to you. Could you post your email in the chat, please, in case people have questions? Of course, of course. and I'm uh, also um, happy to hang out. Uh, a little bit if anyone wants to, um, you know, stay and chat. I'm posting my uh, email in the chat. Uh, you know, I'm also on all the social media platforms. Um, so always happy to connect with folks and and be challenged and, you know, and, 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 and really learn more um, uh, from everyone else because I don't know. Uh, one of the things I know now is that I don't know. Uh, and the more I do this work, the, the less I know. So... Um, it's well, thanks, thanks to your presentation, we know a lot more, and we also <laughs> realize how much more there is for us to learn. Your email, in case people can't access it in the chat, is henry at livingpeaceinstitute.com, and I know you welcome questions and communications there, henry at livingpeaceinstitute.com, and I know that many people will be motivated to contribute to Razom for Ukraine, that's R-A-Z-O-M-F-O-R-Ukraine.org for humanitarian relief 
in Ukraine. Henry Yampolsky, this is just a terrific presentation on behalf of Jean and Sarid, Natalie, the whole Will Work for Food project team. We thank you very much. You're just terrific. We encourage people to get the book, Dissolving Conflict from Within, your brand new book. And with that, we are complete. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You can stop the recording, sorry. Yeah.